Hi. In this video, we're going to discuss the process of transcription, which is the act of copying DNA into RNA in a process which is basically turning genes on. DNA is the repository for all information. RNA represents those pieces of information that you're using at a particular time. We'll talk about some of the molecular differences between DNA and RNA. We'll talk about several types of RNA. We'll show you the general machinery which converts DNA to RNA. That's primarily the RNA polymerase. And we'll end with talking about a few differences between bacteria and eukaryotes. On this slide, we see a number of processes that are involved with the concept of gene expression. Gene expression involves taking a portion of the DNA and making an RNA copy from that, exporting the RNA from the nucleus to the cytosol, taking that RNA and making a protein, ensuring that the pro protein is properly folded and active. Gene expression is sometimes used synonymously, somewhat loosely, with the process of making RNA, but gene expression is more pro properly concerned with all of these processes. Levels of RNA depend not only on making RNA, but the rate at which it's degraded also. Protein levels depend on the amount of protein that is made and the rate at which it is degraded. Once again, a misconception here is sometimes that the levels of gene expression are only associated with the rate of making RNA. But you know that the level of anything is a balance between the rates that it's made and the rates at which, at which it's degraded. Part of the reason for the bias is that we know a lot more about how RNA is made and how proteins are made than how they're degraded. And that's in part because we, they are studied more. But nevertheless, the two processes are equally important. So here we see again the central dogma. DNA makes RNA makes protein. We've studied previously the process of DNA replication, which is DNA making DNA. Today we'll talk about transcription, DNA going to RNA. And a little later we'll talk about translation, RNA going to protein. There's no, really no way around memorizing these terms. You can maybe try to remember that translation is converting a nucleic acid code of four bases to an amino acid code of 20 amino acids. That might help you, but whatever works for you is fine. Okay, a little bit of nomenclature when it comes to transcription. DNA has a coding strand and a template strand. The mRNA has the same sequence as the coding strand with U replacing T. But because of the way nucleic acids are th synthesized, it's going to use the template strand when producing the transcribed mRNA. If I were to assign a problem question in class and say, here's a piece of DNA, this is the coding strand, what RNA will it make? You would write down the exact same sequence as the coding strand, but convert the T's, which is in DNA, to U's, which are used in RNA. Now we'll frequently use the expression turning genes on when we're talking about gene transcription. I think it makes intuitive sense, and it's a reminder that you have between 20 and 25,000 genes in your genome. Every cell in your body has the same set of genes. But different parts of your body use different subsets of those 25,000. For instance, in the lung, the lung genes get turned on. There might be 10 to 10,000 to 15,000 of those. In the stomach, stomach genes will get turned on, and it will be a different subset of 10,000 or 15,000 genes. There will be a lot of overlap for sure, but then there will also be genes that are uniquely expressed in one of those two organs. But remember, the stomach and lung have the same set of 25,000 genes from which to choose. It's just going to express different genes to help establish its unique character. Now here we have an example of two genes, gene A and gene B. They are transcribed at different levels and, when they're tr and then they're translated at different levels. A biologist would say that this gene is highly expressed and this gene is weakly expressed. There's not a linear relationship in terms, terms of when a gene is turned on and how many copies of the RNA it will make and how many copies of the protein it will make from each copy of the RNA. But I think a typical number for eukaryotes would be about a thousand. That is, when a gene is getting turned on, it will make at least a thousand copies of an mRNA molecule. And then from each of those mRNA molecules, it will produce about a thousand copies of a protein. So you would have a total of about a million copies of protein per cell. Now that number is a little high, but it serves as an example. Also, there is a large degree of gene-specific variability of the amount of amplification from going to the RNA step to the protein step.
And that's just something that one must learn on a gene by gene basis. The last point I want to make on this slide is to talk a little bit about the ratios from the high express, highest expressed RNAs to the lowest expressed RNAs. In a cell, the dynamic range for RNA expression is about a factor of 1 times 10 to the 4th. But the dynamic range of protein expression can be about 1 times 10 to the 6th. So low abundance proteins can be hard to isolate in the presence of highly abundant protein. And I should mention that these numbers are valid for the inside of cells. In blood, for instance, your serum protein abundances can vary much, much more. The most abundant proteins in serum, albumin and immunoglobulin, for instance, can be 1 times 10 to the 10th times more abundant than the low abundance proteins. This slide is going to compare and contrast DNA and RNA. First we'll look on the right at the structure of RNA. You'll, you'll notice that it is single-stranded, not double-stranded like DNA. But you have the familiar sh phosphate sugar backbone making it a polyanion. You have sugars and you have bases attached to the sugars. The difference in the abbreviations DNA versus RNA is that the D stands for deoxy. Here at the 2' prime carbon, the sugar deoxyribose in DNA has lost the hydroxyl group in the 2' prime position. So it is a deoxy. Whereas in ribonucleic acid, it has the hydroxyl group at that position. As we have mentioned several times before, the bases are slightly different. Both RNA and DNA uses the bases C, A, and G. However, RNA uses uracil instead of thymine. The difference between the two structures is that there is a methyl group at the 5 position in thymine in DNA. The bases are numbered starting at position 1, which is the position that attaches to the sugar. Here's 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. There are at least two possible reasons why thymine is used in DNA. One is the methyl group makes thymine a little more stable, which is if you're trying to preserve information for long periods of time, that makes sense. Uracil is a little less stable, but it's also a little energetically cheaper to make. It costs you something to put that extra methyl group on that nucleotide. So when you are making short-lived copies of RNA, why not save the extra energy? Both uracil and thymine hydrogen bond twice to adenine, using these two groups in approximately this direction. There are many types of RNA in cells. It's an exploding field right now. We're going to talk primarily about three types. We'll talk about mRNA, where the M stands for message. This is the molecule that is a copy of the coding strand of DNA. There are ribosomal RNAs, or rRNA, which are both functional and structural inside the ribosome. They are used to make proteins while reading the mRNA code. The third RNA types are tRNAs for transfer RNAs. And these are the molecules that couple the nucleic acid code to the amino acid code. These tRNAs will bind to mRNA and they'll bring the proper amino acid needed for protein synthesis. Now the book refers to microRNAs. There are lots of different R abbreviations being used for those nowadays. These can be used to help regulate gene expression, both natively used by the cell or we can actually introduce artificial RNAs to help regulate gene expression. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the third part of the course. This is a schematic of RNA polymerase, the main protein machine that converts DNA to RNA. You can see here that the D double DNA helix, which is going to be transcribed, enters through one end of the polymerase along with ribonucleotides that are going to be incorporated into the RNA. The DNA helix is unwound. We see two strands. Why don't you think for a minute which strand is the coding strand and which strand is the template strand? Okay, this is the template strand here and this is the coding strand. By using the template, you're essentially making a copy of the coding strand up here. The DNA is rewound as it exits the polymerase and the RNA exits through a separate channel and back. On this slide, we see the process of RNA polymerase transcribing a gene. The RNA polymerase, in conjunction with the yellow protein right here called the sigma factor, which is used on most genes but not all, help bind the DNA in a region called the promoter. This is an upstream regu regulatory region which we'll learn more about. 
Upstream of a start site, it will begin to add a few bases, and then the sigma factor is released. Now the transcription process can occur much more quickly, and when it hits a special stop sequence, a sequence of nucleotides which tell the RNA polymerase to dissociate, it will release from the DNA double helix. It releases the RNA it has just transcribed, and then it can be used to transcribe another gene. Okay, in the next video, we'll start by looking at some of these regulatory sequences in more detail. Thank you for listening.